Well, we have uh, really the, the perfect speaker for what this week's about, Global Focus. His name is Art Lindsley, Dr. Art Lindsley. He's the father of two Westmont men, one just out of college, one still very much in. Uh, <laughs> Trey and John Lindsley, right over there, and sitting in the same row with their mom. Uh, that, uh, that alone is a good reason to have him here. Art is uh, as a scholar, uh, a thinker, uh, a devoted Christian. He's uh, co-authored a book, uh, for the least of these, A Biblical Answer to Poverty. Uh, this, uh, th th there's some wonderful thinking in this, and actually I've read parts of this book. I don't have the book, but Art just gave it to me, and thank you for this book. Art is uh, the Senior Fellow uh, for the Geneva Institute for Leadership and Public Policy. Uh, he's very involved in training government leaders from developing countries. He's also in charge of a, a government initiative, uh, quote, to transform the world 2020. Uh, mobilizing the world's government leaders to address poverty and other issues. He's thought long and deeply about this and biblically. Uh, Art Lindsay, we're delighted you're here at Westmont. God bless you and come on up. Let's welcome him. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here with you and it's great to be here with Trey and John for a few days. Uh, they love Westmont. It's been a tremendous treat for them to be here. And I will be trying to speak uh, in just 30 minutes on a very big issue, but I hope at least that it will make an impression on you. I worked for many years as president of the C.S. Lewis Institute before I went with the Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics. Uh, and I always have to use quotes from C.S. Lewis. And so here's one of my favorites. You, you probably ought to write down because it's worth thinking about for the rest of your life. It says, reason is the natural organ of truth, but imagination is the organ of meaning. Again, reason is the natural organ of truth, but imagination is the organ of meaning. We don't really understand anything unless we have a picture, metaphor, image, story with which to associate it. Even we don't understand any word unless we have that. And so I'm going to try to give you some images and pictures. So I hope if I you remember nothing else, you remember some of the images that are here. Uh, this is Global Focus Week. And my thesis will be that uh, give a moral case for economic growth and especially entrepreneurship as a solution to poverty. I understand that one of the stresses at Westmont here is entrepreneurship. Uh, they're among the top 10 of people uh, that colleges that have produced entrepreneurs. And then also, you stress doing that now. So uh, that's my theme, to really encourage you in doing that and the importance of this in addressing poverty. I want to start with a film, or a little short video, from the Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics. But it's not so much about us, but about the principles that we stand for. lives are not divided into two halves, with one part being sacred and another part secular. Worship is not reserved only for Sunday morning, but for Monday morning as well. Every time we get out of bed and ready ourselves for the day, Every time we labor at a task, no matter how insignificant it may seem, every moment is a gift. Every moment belongs to the one who gave us that moment. There is a way that leads a man to flourish. It is freedom. freedom to discover his true potential, to keep the fruits of his labor, to find fulfillment in his work. These freedoms are the right of every person because they come woven into the God-given dignity of every person. Where they exist, societies and people flourish. Where 
where they are absent, there is only poverty. These freedoms must be championed, for this is God's design for us, for the good of all he has created. Notice the three uh, topical themes that are there at the end. Freedom, fulfillment, and flourishing. In the contrast we see between them, uh, that which is moral, and I think grounded in the biblical perspective, is uh, on one side, and that which is immoral or unbiblical is on the other side. Uh, you have particularly the moral basis for freedom. And by freedom, I particularly mean... A like a three-legged stool. Uh, you have political freedom, economic freedom, and what's called a more moral religious freedom. And by that I mean virtue and values uh, at the root of things. So that, say, a, a political uh, regime can only rise as high as the characters of those involved. An economic system or a corporation or business can only rise as high as the characters of those involved. So the three-legged stool involves political freedom undergirded by, by virtue and, I hope, biblical values, and also economic freedom undergirded by those kinds of values uh, as well. And so we see freedom uh, contrasted with bondage and slavery. Uh, if people are free, my thesis is, to use their creative gifts as image bearers of God, and they're free to be able to develop the potential of the creation around them, then there'll be fulfillment in their own lives, because that's what we are created for, as we'll talk more about this in a minute. Uh, and that if you have millions of people using their own creative gifts, uh, they'll also be fulfilled and there'll be flourishing within a society, as opposed to poverty. It's very interesting that I, there's a guy at the uh, American University that addresses history, and he did a study and gave a talk for us once on George Washington's favorite verse. And it's particularly this one that's up here, that each one of them, Micah 4.4, 4, each one of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree with no one to make them afraid. And he repeats it so many times in his speeches. This is what he wanted most for America, and he chose this vo verse to be able to undergird it. And the idea was this, to be able, first of all, to enjoy the fruits of your labor, to plant fig trees and have the fruit, to uh, plant vines, and that it takes nurturing and pruning uh, and that kind of thing in order to have vines, to be able to enjoy the fruit of your labor, to sit under your own uh, vine and fig tree. But notice it's your own vine and your own fig tree so that there's private property, that you can have something that you can develop that's your own. Uh, and then you also have, uh, with no one to make them afraid, the idea of safety or security uh, against violence. And really, it's a lot of those things that poor countries lack. They lack the ability to enjoy the fruits of their labor. They lack rule of law and safety. And they also lack private property rights. And if I have time, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this as we go here. Uh, notice here a map. This is a map of North Korea and South Korea at night. And it probably speaks a thousand words just in this image. Because you have a place where there's a political freedom and economic freedom in South Korea. And you have a place that utterly lacks it in North Korea. And you see the difference in the prosperity that it has. And there's an economic freedom scale that there are a couple major studies that are done every year. It's called the Economic Freedom of the World Report. And you can look it up on the internet. Economic Freedom of the World Report. Every year they study every country in the world and they rate it according to several different standards. And you, it's, if you study that, it will teach you a lot of lessons. There's another one called the Wall Street Journal Heritage Religious Freedom Index that gives scores to each one of these countries. So that North Korea is 178 out of 178 countries that are studied in terms of uh, uh, economic freedom, political and economic freedom. South Korea is 71.5, 29th uh, in, in the world 
with regard to economic freedom. I was just spent a week in Korea, just a week before last, with a bunch of network leaders from all over the world and heard again the story of South Korea. Just amazing how in the last uh, 60 years particularly, even, and even more, it's risen out of desperate poverty to relative flourishing. There's still a ways to go there. But it's amazing to see uh, what's happened as a result of entrepreneurship and economic growth. Uh, markets, I believe, are the most uh, productive way to help people uh, and eliminate poverty. For instance, in 1800, 85% lived in extreme poverty. And extreme poverty usually is defined as having $1.25 a day or less. Uh, in 1950, 50% lived in extreme poverty. In 1992, 25% lived in extreme poverty. In 2007, 15% lived in extreme poverty. And just uh, a week or two ago, the World Bank came out with this most recent report and said that uh, in 2015, 10%, or actually less than 10%, 9.6% live in desperate poverty, and they've raised the amount to $1.90 a day. Now, of course, that's not much. That's still extreme poverty. If you make $1.90 a day or, or above, you're still in a pretty desperate strait. And there's still 700 billion people that are below that line. So there's a whole lot to do with regard to poverty. But it's amazing how much poverty has been reduced over, the years, over these years. 25 countries in 25 years have risen out of this desperate poverty by following these principles of markets. According to Jim Kim, the president of the World Bank, poverty can be eliminated by that mean, meaning desperate poverty can be eliminated by 2030. And he means by that there always will be about a 3% of situational poverty that are caused by disasters. But he thinks that, that that's a realistic goal if we continue on in, in the and the direction that we're going and following the principles that we understand here. Uh, let me just stay with that for just a second more. This is not something, by the way, that is just a, a left-right thing, at least in the evangelical world. This is something that pretty much people across the boards uh, believe. Uh, conservative people, middle of the road, and on the evangelical left. In fact, I chose this chart just so that I would be honest, from Jim Wallace, from Sojourners, from one of his most recent books. And he says that government, markets, uh, and nonprofits have a significant role in addressing poverty. It, there might be a difference as to what role government should play, but markets are important. The other guy, Ron Sider, who's written probably what is the most influential book on poverty, Rich Christians in the Age of Hunger, uh, had, in his fifth edition, says that the thing he most neglected in all these years in which this book was very prominent in helping evangelicals think was the place of markets. I just talked to him uh, last November and just commended him on what he said, and he was even stronger in what he said. He said, uh, you know how when you're 20 and you're not a socialist, uh, you don't have a heart, and if you're 40 and you're not a capitalist, you don't have a mind. <laughs> and he... Uh, he said that and he said, well, with some qualifications. Obviously, he's not right-wing uh, in terms of his perspective. But he did see that there's an importance of markets uh, as really helping this issue of poverty. And by that, I mean particularly entrepreneurship and business conducted ethically. Now, they would stress, and I would agree, uh, the importance of the triple bottom line. The triple bottom line is people, planet, and profits. All three together. Not just profits as a bottom line. People, planet, and profits. And sometimes the fourth area, purpose, is added to it. And I know a number of companies that are really passionate about this. Including I've met with the top person as far as the global corporate culture of Mars Incorporated. And they're really stressing this kind of thing. And I know many, many other companies that are as well. Uh, I came across a really interesting quote from Bono. And... He has done a lot in terms of live aid, giving foreign aid to many different people. And, but here's what he said in his 2013 speech at Georgetown University. Aid is just a stopgap. Commerce and entrepreneurial capitalism takes more people out of poverty than aid. In dealing with poverty here and around the world, welfare and foreign aid are a band-aid. Free enterprise is the cure. Entrepreneurship is the most sure way of development. And I think there's a widespread agreement of that uh, overseas and even within the U.S. as well by many, many people. Here's an issue of uh, Prism Magazine, 
which is Evangelical, Evangelicals for Social Action. This has come out of Ron Sider's group. And it has on the front, Entrepreneurs for Social Action. And at the bottom, uh, Bono and Capitalism with a Conscience. So uh, there's a widespread agreement of people, of many people on the left and right uh, about these issues. Uh, so there's uh, much to be done here. Uh, I think that it's important to realize the bi foundational biblical principles in addressing this issue. First of all, that we are created in God's image. In Genesis uh, 1, 26 to 28, it talks about how uh, twice uh, male and female are created in the image of God. It's called sometimes the cultural mandate. The mandate that our, our purpose in creation, why God created us, is to come together as image bearers of God and use our gifts uh, and our potential to develop the potential of the creation around us. That's what you were created for. Now because of the fall, that's been desperately affected. But hopefully as you're redeemed, you're redeemed not only to carry out the gospel, to be sure, to the nations, but you're also redeemed to be able to fulfill the cultural mandate. To be able, as image bearers of God, uh, be able to address things throughout the world. Uh, Got to give another C.S. Lewis quote. C.S. Lewis says this. He says, there are no ordinary people. You have never met a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, art civilizations, what are they? They are to our life as the life of a gnat. And C.S. Lewis believed that and he lived it out. In fact, he wrote letters to everybody, handwritten letters, because he didn't like to type and he didn't have a computer, so he hand wrote letters to everybody that wrote to him. And at the height of his popularity, he was receiving tons of letters. He spent hours of every day doing that. Now, why did he do that? He wrote letters to children. He wrote letters to uh, a, a, a priest in Latin. He wrote uh, letters to an American lady who was a rather bizarre character, if you ever had a chance to read that correspondence. He has thousands of letters out there now. It's a whole uh, body of uh, study in terms of C.S. Lewis because of the letters. Why did he write so many letters? I think it's because he believed there are no ordinary people. You've never met a mere mortal. He also gave away uh, every, all of his honorarium, uh, all of his speaking fees, all, all of the things from his books, uh, put it into an agape fund and gave it to people to help them. Why did he give away so much? Because there are no ordinary people. You've never met a mere mortal. Uh, and I would say this is important. It's important for us and also important in addressing poverty and poor people that are poor. Uh, just try today uh, to walk around and address each person you meet as the image bearer of God. Now that doesn't mean you have to be effusive, that you've got to hug everybody or shake everybody's hand. It's just act as if, really act as if, treat people as if they're not invisible. <laughs> you know, just uh, don't see through them. Just treat people with the kind of worth, value, and dignity you have. And if you go off campus, you go to McDonald's, you go to uh, CVS, wherever you go, just look at the person as a person of dignity. And this is not just something for a day. This is something for a life <laughs> to embed in you. And that's true with regard to the poor. The poor are not just people to help. They're people made in the image of God. Poverty is more than just a material thing. In fact, people that were poor, like in Rwanda, were asked about uh, poverty. Uh, there was uh, people from Hope International there just getting them to talk about what does poverty mean to you? And here are a list of some of the things they said. Poverty is an empty heart. Another one, not knowing abilities and strengths. Isolation. No hope in yourself. Can't take care of my family. Broken relationships. Not knowing God. Lack of good thoughts. Only one person said no money and not enough to eat. Now, obviously, money and not enough to eat is important. But uh, poverty is more than that. It's really affirming people's worth and value and dignity and helping establish in them the ability that they can do things. And sometimes that's more than just words. It means loving people to life, showing them that they have a worth, value, and dignity and they really can use their gifts to impact the world around them. That's utterly crucial. So poverty is more than just a material thing. Uh, we're called to creativity. This is the entrepreneurship side of it. Uh, it says in just Genesis 1, 26 to 28, that we're image bearers of God uh, to exercise dominion 
And sometimes, I, I, I like that word, sometimes I don't. Sometimes it gets the idea, dominion might be the idea that you put your foot on somebody and, and you know, squeeze them into the ground. That's not what dominion means. In fact, if you look at Genesis 2.15, You'll see that our purpose is to care for the garden and to keep it, to watch over it carefully. It's not to rape it or to hurt it. It's to really develop it carefully and care for it. So I would say a better word is creativity. This is what many people have used, like, like Tolkien and, uh, and, and others have really used this idea of, uh, with respect to, uh, to uh, creativity. That we are sub-creators. That only God can create something out of nothing. But we are called to create something out of something. We're called to take, say, clay and make a statue. Wood and make a house or a chair. Uh, take metal and make a musical instrument or a tool. Whatever. We're to, we're to use the elements of the creation to develop the potential. To use our inventiveness. Our uh, creativity. Uh, our ability to be entrepreneurs. To address the creation around us. Again, that's an important call uh, in terms of who we are. And one of the things that's most affirmed within the biblical perspective is this. Not only in, in the cultural mandate there in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, but Jesus is a tremendous model. I've been just reading a book on the whole history of the West. And it's amazing how many cultures, and especially Greek culture, despise manual labor. On the, by contrast... Jesus uh, lived for, I'd say, about 20 years as a, a carpenter. And probably from the age 12 or 13, what it, when he would have been apprenticed to, it says in Luke 3.23, he, he was about 30 when he started his ministry. So it, if it's 31, 32, 33, it's either 18 years perhaps, or maybe 20 years he worked as a carpenter. And the Greek word there for carpenter probably means more than just working with wood. It means working with stone and working with metal. Uh, and he probably, on some projects, didn't work by himself. Involved his brothers or other people uh, in this kind of project. I was, was recently talking, I had dinner with Michael Novak, who is a tremendous thinker. He's written 50-some books. He was given the Templeton Prize of a million dollars for writing particularly a book, The Spirit of Democratic Capitalism. Just a tremendous godly man with brilliant... Uh, brilliant mind. And, and I said to him, after talking about his whole history, by the way, he knew every presidential candidate on the left and on the right, Democrat and Republican, and spent individual time with him. He also knew every pope closely, starting with Vatican II up. So we talked about those stories. But at the end of our time, I said, what would you want to tell a group of people, a group of Christians at a Christian college, about this issue of business? He said, I want them to know that Jesus was a small businessman. That Jesus was involved 20 years uh, in doing this. And if Jesus sent the Son of God, he said the verbum Dei, to be a small businessman, then it must be okay to be involved in business. There's nothing intrinsically evil necessarily about it. Also, although people can do many evil things uh, in, in the name of business or through their business. And I would say the most important things with regard to the poor is to show them that they have gifts and creativity and that they can use these in the world. Uh, I think that if people are going to be able to fulfill our God-given purpose, uh, that's a good thing. But if they're not, there's frustration. The more free we are to be creative and to be entrepreneurs, the more we can experience our humanness. The larger government or other controlling factors uh, become, the less we can experience our humanness. Uh, Peter Greer tells a story from his uh, chapter in For the Least of These called Stop Helping Us. And he tells a story of a church in the Ukraine that uh, American church wanted to help. And they sent over uh, food and clothes and medical supplies uh, that, that were really helping the needs of the people. And they sent it over a couple times a year. And of course it was greatly appreciated by the people there in the Ukraine. But they kept doing it. And after a few years, the pastor finally had to say to the American church, stop helping us. Because it was encouraging a kind of dependency and entitlement that was actually uh, counterproductive. People uh, were less generous, less giving. 
that kept saying, well, let's wait for the Americans to send what they are going to send. Now, there's a great quote by Bob Lupton called, uh, in his book, Toxic Charity, and it says this, Give once and you elicit appreciation. Give twice, you create anticipation. Give three times, you create expectation. Give four times, it becomes entitlement. Give five times and you establish dependency. And this is not just a theoretical problem, it's an actual problem. In Africa, I work with a lot of network leaders for the last several years in various different organizations. Uh, I don't have time to talk about all of that. And with these government leaders in Transform World, and this is a real thing, not just a verbal thing. Many obstacles to growth, and I'm uh, limited in my time to talk about it. I could probably talk an hour on each one of these th things. But violence is the, one of the great problems in addressing poverty. Just to give you one illustration about it. Uh, that you ha uh, there's a guy we know from Nigeria. We see every year in Geneva when we go there for the Geneva Institute for Leadership and Public Policy that trains government leaders in, the in developing countries uh, in principles that are consistent with the Bible but not explicitly <laughs> biblical when we teach them. But... Uh, it's, it's one of the things that we teach them is, uh, are these things. But anyway, he talks about the, the violence that ha that's happening in Nigeria. He goes around with uh, networks of pastors trying to save lives. His village was wiped out violently uh, by Boko Haram. When he preaches on Sunday morning, there are about 10 people with AK-47s standing around his, his church. This is not unusual in the d developing world that there's much violence. Uh, there's also a uh, problem of foreign aid. Now, foreign aid is a good thing when it's response to disasters and that's emergency relief. But when it becomes a permanent solution, it's been disastrous. In fact, there's a book. Uh, uh, there are books on this thing, particularly a book by Moyo called Dead Aid that's worth reading that gives the most extreme statement, Stop Sending Foreign Aid. Uh, and then there are other books that in, are in this area. I just watched a film that you need to show here at Westmont called Poverty Cure Inc. It's won 11 awards for documentaries. It basically says we need to rethink the whole poverty industry. Because uh, there's a book, When Helping Hurts. Much of what has been intended to help has actually hurt in terms of this whole issue of alleviating poverty. Like foreign aid, 130 billion uh, over the last 40 years has been misused. 85% of foreign aid goes to, differences, goes to purposes other than which it was intended. And I can say much more about it. There's been much corruption. It's one of the things that's uh, a problem. Like for instance, in Africa in 2003, 10 million, half of the aid, left the continent. It was put in Swiss bank accounts or offshore accounts somewhere. Uh, it's been amazing that the amount of corruption that's there. Just uh, in Korea the week before last, there's a, a pastor that was asked by government leaders of Ethiopia where corruption is rampant. He said, we need people of integrity. He said, if you can give us 40 people that you'll train to be people of integrity, we'll put them in government offices. And if they do well, we could maybe do up to 100 people. This is a problem right across uh, the world on this issue. Uh, you've got unintended consequences. Let me just give you one instance of it. I don't have time to really go through much else because I have a closing video. But unintended consequences, we'll say eggs. It would be my illustration. Uh, one church in, in, in Atlanta sent uh, over eggs to a, uh, a town in Africa. And, of course, they were grateful to receive the eggs. But unbeknownst to them, there was a guy in that city that was, uh, made his living by selling eggs. And, of course, he was driven out of business by those eggs. And then after a year, they stopped sending eggs, and there were no eggs. They had to go to another village to get the eggs. That's happened time and again. I could give you 20 illustrations of this kind of thing, where good intentions have actually hurt in the end, rather than helped. Uh, regulations and property rights are major problems. But I don't have time to really address it right now. Uh, the best way to help the poor, as well as the whole society, is to encourage economic freedom and by that, again, I mean markets, entrepreneurship, that kind of thing, uh, in the context of the rule of law. We ought never to underestimate the potential of people. These are people uh, that are made in the image of God, uphold people's dignity, and encourage economic freedom and entrepreneurship. Let me just uh, close with a film 
uh, that makes Imagine sense. you had to live in a country from one of these two lists for the rest of your life. Which list would you choose? If you're like most people, you would choose A. Let's take a look at why that is. Take Chile and Venezuela. Chile's poverty rate is half that of Venezuela's, and its inflation rate is a fraction of the size. Actually, all of list A appears to be better off than B. Look at income per person. It's 10 times higher on average in list A. But these lists aren't organized by income. They're organized by economic freedom. List A countries have the most free economies in the world. List B, the least free. Across the globe, we see a strong relationship between economic freedom and people's quality of life. For instance, people in the most free countries earn, on average, over eight times more than people in the least free. The poor earn ten times more. People in the most free countries are happier. They have better protected civil rights, cleaner environments, and the average person lives 20 years longer. The freest countries also have less corruption, less infant mortality, less child labor, and less unemployment. So if you care about improving people's lives, then you really care about economic freedom. And having economic freedom means your property is protected under an impartial rule of law. You're free to trade with others for what you need and want. Your money keeps its value because your national currency is stable. And government stays small relative to the size of the economy. For years, the U.S. was among the world leaders in economic freedom. But over the last decade, the U.S.'s ranking fell and it's projected to keep falling. The question is, will our quality of life fall with it? So my, my call to you is to keep on, as Westmont uh, graduates, encouraging entrepreneurship as a way of addressing poverty. Uh, start companies in the developing world that involve people and turn it over to them. Train local uh, entrepreneurs and mentor them. There are many organizations that are doing this. A Transformational Business Network, Spring Hill Management, and many others that I could mention that you could work along with. So thank you for this time, and let me just close in a word of prayer and give you benediction. Thank you for uh, each person here made in the image of God. I pray that they might uh, really grasp by the power of your spirit to develop their, their potential and be able to use it in this world in a way that makes a difference for many people, including the poor. And now when the Lord bless you and keep you, may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forever. Amen. Thank you.